Diabetes mellitus has been the scourge of mankind for thousands of years. It's so common in the general population that some call it the modern epidemic. It has been a long journey, but we're beginning to understand more about the cause of diabetes, especially the entity of insulin resistance, the role of food, hmm, and obesity, and how to treat it. Hello, and welcome to the Prince Mahidon Award Conference. I'm Pavit Pienvijit, and joining me today at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel is Professor Raf DeFranco, recipient of the 2022 Prince Mahidon Award. He's a man who greatly advanced our understanding of diabetes, which led to new drugs to be used in the clinical practice today. He's the professor of medicine, chief of diabetes division at the University of Texas, San Antonio. Professor DeFranco, it's so great to have you here with us. First off, can you tell us how long have you been in the field of endocrinology? Uh, I've been doing it so long, I've almost forgotten uh, <laughs> how, how long. No, so I uh, joined the faculty at Yale in 1975. So I guess officially as a faculty member, 48 years. But, uh, you know, if I throw in a couple of years of being a fellow, uh, about uh, 50 years. So I've been doing it a long time. I've seen lots of changes. Uh, uh, and I guess the good part is I've been able to change with the changes and stay ahead of them. If you have a minute to explain the concept of diabetes to a lay person, what would you say? Yeah. So diabetes is uh, not a simple thing to explain because in the most general sense, there are two very different types of diabetes mm. and they're called type one and type two. So type one is what we call an autoimmune disease. Uh, for whatever reason, the body decides that your pancreas and these are the cells that make insulin doesn't belong there and it rejects the pancreas. You basically lose all of your beta cells, all of your insulin, your blood sugar goes very high and you're gonna require insulin for the rest of your life. Uh, the other type of type two is type two diabetes, the type of diabetes, which is what I've been working on. Uh, and this is sort of a balance between how much insulin can your beta cells make and how sensitive, how do you respond uh, to the insulin? And people with type two diabetes, their tissues are very, very resistant to insulin. They make some insulin, not enough to overcome the insulin resistance. And just like in type ones, your glucose goes up. In type two, the glucose goes up. And when your blood sugar goes high, it can cause nerve damage. Most people know diabetes and blindness go hand in hand. It causes kidney damage and it causes uh, uh, damage to the, to the nerves. Also the blood vessels, arthroscores. Yeah. Well, what we've now come to learn is that uh, people with type two diabetes and now also type one, their big problem, uh, if they don't go blind or end up on dialysis, they have heart attacks and strokes. Mm. So there's this big cardiovascular, and you're a cardiologist yourself, there's a big cardiovascular component to diabetes. So we actually have gone from a very glucocentric disease, mm. where we try to lower the glucose back into the normal range to prevent the eye, kidney, and nerve damage, that now we recognize if we want people to live longer, we need to protect them against the cardiovascular damage, the damage to the, the, the blood vessels. And we also know that all other organs uh, are involved. The liver gets involved, as I said, eye, kidneys. So it's really a global uh, problem. What makes someone resistant to insulin? I think that's a key word. Dad. Yeah. So this is basically uh, what I've spent my life uh, doing. Uh, and uh, what we've shown is that if you can look into a cell mm. and I have spent my life developing techniques so that uh, we can look into cells while the people are alive. In order for insulin to work, it needs to bind to a receptor on a cell. And then once it binds to the receptor on the cell, it activates a whole host of mechanisms that allow your bodies to metabolize glucose. Uh, and it turns out that right from the beginning, the ability of insulin to bind and activate its receptor, there's a major defect there. And then at multiple other steps within the cell, there's a defect. But this same insulin resistance that leads to high glucose, the same molecular defect is what promotes cardiovascular disease. And that is why cardiovascular disease, okay, and diabetes, the complications that go with high glucose cannot be separated. So when you meet a diabetic person for the first time, 15 or 20% already have manifest cardiovascular disease. But if you look at the other 80% who are not symptomatic, you'll find they all have significant uh, 
disease in the blood vessels, although they may not yet be having the symptoms yet. I'm sure you've seen so many great advances in the field of diabetes during the past 20 years or so. Uh -huh. Can you summarize the key ones for us? Yeah, so I guess I have to separate this into type 1 and type 2. So for type 1 diabetes, I would say the major advances are continuous glucose monitoring. Now, people can mm. wear a little patch, yeah. uh, and literally they can get a second-to-second -second readout of what their glucose is, which allows them now to avoid hypoglycemia and to adjust their insulin dose. The other big thing that we see in the field of type 1 is we have a bionic pancreas now. So uh, we actually uh, have a sensor that you can wear that measures the glucose. It sends a signal to a pump, which you wear in your belt, and that adjusts the insulin. And then uh, you can then now uh, regulate the insulin uh, and prevent hypoglycemia. The other big advance now is we have the first drug just approved literally within the last month uh, uh, for uh, preventing uh, the autoimmune response and protecting your pancreatic uh, beta cells. It's an anti-CD3 uh, antibody, so a lot of excitement here. In the field of type 2 diabetes, uh, somewhat different. So things that you are aware of, we've had uh, these very large cardiovascular uh, and renal outcome trials that have shown that certain drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitor class of drugs, which, by the way, I invented, didn't patent, that was not so smart, okay? Big mistake there. <laughs> very, very big mistake. Yeah. But that class of drugs now uh, is uh, been shown to be very effective in treating different types of heart disease and kidney sure. disease. We also have the big cardiovascular outcome trials with the GLP-1 uh, receptor uh, agonist. Again, uh, cardio uh, protection. Uh, and what's driving the diabetes epidemic is the obesity epidemic which has been very, very difficult to control. And I, I know I was here last time, maybe about 30 years ago. I, I could see people are- you know, Getting like, a little bit bigger. Getting a little that's, bit bigger. That's true. But, but these newer drugs, the GLP-1 receptor agonist, are fantastic. They, they can uh, cause up to 15 to 20% uh, weight loss. So actually getting very close to what we see for, for bariatric uh, surgery. Okay, what do you think is your greatest contribution to the field? Oh my God. I know you're a great educator, and that's, that's <laughs> yeah. an understatement, yeah. but what do you think personally is your greatest contribution? To yeah. So, uh, you know, when I started uh, my career at Yale, uh, everybody believed that what caused type 2 diabetes you make enough insulin. Uh, and what we showed, and believe me, it took a long time to convince people, is the problem uh, was not that you didn't make enough insulin, but the tissues in your body were very, very resistant to insulin. And I developed uh, new techniques that allow you to actually quantitate for the first time the severity of insulin resistance. And this is what really changed the tide. And I would say probably the second biggest contribution, and, and I have to say the ADA standard of care for the first time in 2023 now is recognized. Uh, there are many, many pathophysiologic defects. And when I gave the Banting lecture in 2008, I titled it from the triumvirate, which is my Lilly lecture in 1987, to the ominous octet, okay. a new paradigm for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And, you know, if you have eight problems that you have to deal with, no one drug is going to correct eight problems. Mm. And we actually have now shown quite conclusively in the EDIC study, you really need to start with two or three drugs right from the beginning. Well, what do you think is the future of diabetes uh, treatment? Oh, uh, well, uh, to me, as I said, I think the future for type 2s is you really need to start very early. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I have a, a, a talk here, this uh, title, Pre-Diabetes, -pre Time to Treat. So not just starting in the pre-diabetic state, but even before that. And you definitely need to start with uh, drugs uh, that attack multiple of the pathophysiologic disturbances. And you need to use the newer drugs that protect your kidneys as well as protect your heart. So just lowering glucose is not enough, mm. okay? If, if I lower the glucose and you don't go bl blind, that's good. But if you have your heart attack and die, that's not so good. Mm. And uh, we have now a lot of new technology that's coming along. The antisense nucleotides that you actually can target a gene that is malfunctioning and you can uh, actually inhibit in a specific tissue, a specific gene, 
And then I think the CRISPR technology where people have genetic defects that you actually can go in and you can alter the DNA and take a mutant gene and restore it back to normal. Sounds very optimistic. I think that's a good way to end our conversation. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Glad to be here. And that was Professor Raf DeFranzo, recipient of the 2022 Prince Mahidon Award. See you back in a bit. Let us switch gear a bit and talk about cancer prevention. It's one of the most important goals in medicine, and believe it or not, some forms of cancer can be prevented with vaccines. Hello again, and welcome to the Prince Mahidon Award Conference. I'm Pavit Pienvijit, and next we'll talk to the 2022 Prince Mahidon Award recipients, who are the pioneers behind the human papilloma virus vaccine. With me are Dr. Douglas Lowy, Deputy Director, National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland, and Dr. John Schiller, NIH Distinguished Investigator and Deputy Chief of Cellular Oncology Lab at the NIH. Thank you again for being here with us today. And uh, I guess the first question is, how do you guys get involved with the HPV vaccine? Go ahead. Well, John and I have worked together for many years. Uh, and relatively soon after it was uh, shown that HPV infection caused cervical cancer, uh, he and I thought it would be interesting, important to see about developing a vaccine for it. And we then simply started working on it. There had been several attempts to do this and they hadn't been successful. We had a somewhat different idea that we'll explain in a few minutes. And that's really what we thought, well, let's just try this. And if it doesn't work, then we'll continue to do other things. Why do you choose vaccination other than, say, antiviral? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. But even to this day, there are no antivirals against this, this particular virus. It's a very hard virus to make antivirals. So it was worthwhile to, to pursue both in parallel, but the vaccine has worked spectacular, and we still don't have antivirals. OK. I, I would say that antivirals are very good for treatment but you need to know somebody is infected mm. and you need to have an effective treatment uh, and you need to be able to give it to them. Mm -hmm. Whereas with a vaccine, you just need to vaccinate people and you're finished. Good, good. Mm -hmm. And what's the global burden of uh, cancers caused by HPV? Well, they're shown on this slide uh, and by far it is dominated by cervical cancer, where now it is estimated that close to about 600,000 cases per year. And there are other uh, cancers that are also caused by HPV. S some of them, the anal vulvovagin and penis, they are also anogenital cancers. And the last one, oropharynx, uh, occurs uh, really in the mouth, but in the back, in the back of the mouth. Uh, and together, this burden represents well over 5% of all the cancers caused every year in the world. Okay, how does HPV cause cancer? Not every virus will cause cancer, so this yeah, is quite right. unique. Yeah. So with a virus, normally when you get a virus infection, your immune system recognizes and it goes away. Mm -hmm. But in, in rare cases, you have what's called a persistent infection and the infection stays. And so there are genes that are expressed by the viruses that causes the cells to replicate abnormally. And in addition, they cause genetic changes in the cells that over time lead the cell to become from a normal cell to a cancer cell. How effective is a vaccine so far in, in, the, in the literature? Well, it really seems to be able to prevent the vast majority of infections caused by the HPV types that are targeted by the vaccine. The two problems are, number one, that there are some HPV types which are not specifically targeted by the vaccine. And if a patient is exposed to that type, then uh, he or she may still get infected. The second problem is that the vaccine is not therapeutic. So once somebody is infected, they are not going to get regression or clearance of their infection from the vaccine. Luckily, most infections go away on their own, but not a subset of them. And the ones with persistent infection, those are the ones that are at risk of getting cervical cancer. Okay. And this is why it's so important that 
that people get vaccinated before they become sexually active. Yes. Because once they have the infection, as Doug said, then it doesn't do anything. So we really focus this vaccine on adolescent individuals. But in terms of efficacy, it's, it really is amazing that in all the clinical trials, nobody who got vaccinated before they, they got infection went on and got a precancerous state. Mm. So it's been 100% protective against the precursor for cancer. Good. Uh, what has been the impact of the vaccine uh, in the incidence of uh, cancer, and what do you think will happen in the future? Sir, the, the cancers generally take 10 to 20 years from infection to developing the cancer. So we're only getting data right now. Uh, several countries have shown that for women who were vaccinated before they were 17, there's about a 90% reduction in cervical cancer compared to so the women. Road, I mean, yes, road. Uh, compared to the women who were not uh, who, who were not vaccinated. Going forward, we can extrapolate that really to the world. But it's really important for everyone to be vaccinated. Otherwise, you're not going to get the kind of protection. On a more practical note, uh, vaccine hesitancy has been a problem in, in all sorts of disease. Mm -hmm. It's the cost, the frequency, and also, the, you know, just the hesitancy in general. How do we overcome these things? Well, it's, it's actually quite difficult, okay? It's, in general, you just have to convince, what I, what I say is it's very simple. If you can take one or two shots, that can prevent you from getting cancer later in your life and killing you, why wouldn't you do it? To me, that's the easiest yeah. message. Yeah. I think that a, a really important, it's a very important question. And to me, the number one priority is safety. Hmm. And the HPV vaccine, both the first generation vaccine that John was talking about and the second generation have been evaluated extensively uh, with millions of doses, and there haven't been any showstoppers in terms of serious recurrent problems that have been seen. And so people who are understandably and appropriately worried about safety can be reassured that the vaccine doesn't just work, but it's very unlikely to be associated with a serious side effect. Is there any application of uh, vaccine-based prevention of cancer in the future? So there, there are several other viruses that cause cancer. Like for instance, Epstein-Barr virus, uh, hepatitis C, um, a bacteria called Helobacter pylori. And people are working on those to develop vaccines. They're, they're harder targets than HPV for various reasons because of, of their biology. But um, we have, I wouldn't say confidence, but, but we're hopeful that vaccines for those infectious diseases that cause cancer will also be developed in the not too distant future. Yeah. I mean, I think what would be really exciting and important would be if we could figure out how to make vaccines against cancers which are not caused by infectious agents. I think we learned a lot from you guys today. And thank you so much for talking to us today and hope to see you in Thailand again soon. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And that was Dr. Douglas Lowy and Dr. John Schiller from the NIH, recipients of the 2022 Prince Medon Award. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to Prince Medon Award channel. We'll see you again next time. Good.